Hello and welcome to our third virtual field trip. On this trip, I am at Arcadia Campground um, in the Ponderosa Pine Forest uh, at about 7,000 or eight, between seven and 8,000 feet up Mount Graham. Um, now, as I said, this is a Ponderosa Pine Forest. So most of the trees that you see behind me are uh, Pinus ponderosa, but I wanted to introduce you to this forest ecosystem. Now, a ponderosa pine forest ecosystems are among ponderosa pine forests are in very uh, dry places, relatively dry places for pine trees. So they are going to be the pine trees that you find in the drier parts of the West. Um, all right, so let's talk about the ponderosa pine tree. Um, I'm going to go up to this one right behind me and bring it in right behind me here. Uh, a few things about this, these ponderosa pine trees. First of all, if you look up, there it is. It's very, very, very tall. Um, very tall. These are fire tolerant trees. That means they can handle a little bit of, uh, you know, fire on the ground. Um, and in fact, they like fire on the ground to burn away all of this fuel, all of these needles that are on the ground, and also to keep uh, other plants away from them. This particular one here, you can almost see some of the darkness on here. So it has a fire scar on it. And so if you were to cut down uh, these trees, and if they were older, you would see some fire scars on them because of when they grew. Now, a few years ago, one of these trees got hit by lightning, and so uh, it began to die, and eventually the Forest Service came in and cut it down. It was a beautiful old-growth tree, and it is right here. So this is that tree right here. Uh, you can see this is where the lightning hit right here and burned it out a little bit. Um, it, it's kind of wet. It's been a, a wet week. And so we've got a little bit of snow here. And so you can't see the, the tree rings that are on here. But if you were to look really closely, and let's see if I can get closer, you can see the tree rings, right? And so you probably know tree rings are the annual growth of a tree. Um, the, the brighter, wider portions of a tree ring uh, represent the spring and summer uh, or early summer growth um, because that's when the, the tree is actively growing. And then the darker, uh, narrower lines in a tree ring are the um, late summer, fall, and winter growth because they're not, they're not doing much growth right then. Um, and so they're darker. And that's a tree ring. So those are the annual tree rings. And they're very useful in trying to figure out how old a tree is uh, from the center here. So you can see the very center of this tree right there. Right there. Okay. So tree rings. This tree, and I think I counted it once, so it was well over 100 years old. Um, it's been a while. Uh, but yes, so a few things about our ponderosa pine trees uh, or any pine tree. As you know, pine trees are evergreens. Um, they are considered softwoods. And um, uh, as I said, they are fire tolerant. One of the th neat things about ponderosa pine is if you go up to them, and especially if you can smell some of the sap, but you can usually smell it on the bark itself, is a vanilla smell. So next time you're up here, if you come to Arcadia Campground, go up to one of them and see if you can smell some vanilla coming from that tree, okay? Now, um, you can't, well, let me just pick up some of these old needles. Now, here is some of those needles. They're obviously dead, uh, but these needles are about five inches long, and that's very typical of a ponderosa pine tree. Now, um, oh goodness, I'll have to look for a, a cone here. If I find a cone, I'll show you, show it to you. Ponderosa pine cones are big and they are hard. They're like baseballs, hard. 
okay? And so uh, you can always find them. They usually only co come out during uh, sometime in the spring. So they're not out on the trees all the time, but you can find them around here. Now I do see, here, here's one. Now this one, this one isn't what they usually look like. This one has been chewed on by uh, squirrels. There's lots of squirrels up here. Most of the squirrels up here are an invasive or an invader squirrel. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the red squirrel, it's the native squirrel on, on Mount Graham. Um, the, the invasive squirrels have been chasing out the, the red squirrel. Um, so this was most likely done by one of those invasive squirrels that are around. Um, still very cute, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, that's, that's something that they did. Now, there is another tree right close to me here. So I'm going to turn around. right here. Now, it's hard for you to see, but this is not a pine tree. This, so you can tell by grabbing it, and also look really closely. First of all, uh, the, they're not bundles of needles. In pine trees, you have bundles of needles. Here's, here's a Here's our pine tree. Again, very long needles for the ponderosa pine. And if you look at the base, uh, there is a bundle of needles. Uh, usually for the ponderosa pine, it's two to three bundle uh, needles per what we call these little red things at the base. These are called fascicles on pine trees. And they, are, they usually have a couple of needles in a bundle. Okay, that's typical of a pine tree. Now this tree right here, does not have that, okay? If you look real closely there, they're not in bundles. And also, um, they're very different. They don't have fascicles, okay? Only pine trees have fascicles. This is called a Douglas fir. It's not a true fir. Um, for, and the way you know if a, a tree is a fir tree is if you can grab it, Grab the needles and it doesn't feel pokey to your hands. If it does feel pokey, that means it's a spruce. These are fur, although Douglas fir is, is actually a fake fir. It's not really a fir tree. Um, it's a fake fir. Um, its scientific name is Soda Suga, which means fake fir. Okay. Um, Douglas trees um, and it's wrapping around this ponderosa pine here. So I'm gonna get close to it. You're gonna see that its bark looks different than our, um, our ponderosa pine. It's got a little more of a gray look. Um, let me jump to our ponderosa pine again. So look at the difference. Oh, that one's all wet. That'll confuse you. All right, so look at this one. These ones, see how it's got kind of that red look to the bark, right? It's really flaky looking bark. That's our ponderosa pine. Now let's go back to our Douglas fir. Uh, Douglas firs are also probably the most common Christmas tree. Tree, Obviously a lot smaller than this particular one. Uh, this one goes pretty tall, okay? Um, but it is... Uh, one of our Christmas trees. All right, so we've got a few cones here. The one on the right is the one I showed you before. And so that's the um, ponderosa pine cone that's been eaten on by, by squirrels. And I'll put uh, a regular one. I've got a picture somewhere. Um, so I'll add that to the video. Um, on the left, we've got uh, the Douglas fir cone. And you can see that it's a bit different, okay? Um, and in the middle, we've got a male cone. Um, and so many plants have um, uh, uh, either female cones or male cones, and that would make them monoecious. But if they have both male and female cones, that makes them dioecious, um, a dioecious plant. And so 
that's what we have here is both male and female cones. So look right here, we've got two young trees coming in, one right there and one right here, two young trees. And so the question is, what kind of tree is it? So I'm gonna zoom in closer based on what I've told you, what kind of tree is that? That is the Douglas fir, right? Cause it's only got one needle and I can check that by grabbing it and it's soft, it's not poking. So I know that's not a spruce it, um, because it has one needle and it's not in a fascicle. Um, we know that that's gonna be the Douglas fir. That'll be a, a little Christmas tree uh, before too long. Let's take a minute to talk about these trash cans. Um, these trash cans are unique, right? So if I open it up, it's got, it's kind of like an old mailbox. You can't see down into it. Um, and you have to, in order to open this thing up, you have to put your hand up in here and put release the lever. Uh, and of course, that's all about uh, preventing bears from getting into trash. We don't want bears getting into trash cans uh, because that attracts attracts them. And as this is a campground, uh, we don't want people and bears to be in the same place. And you can see they've got a little, if bins are full, pack out your trash and you can see a bear on there, right? Okay, um, so the Forest Service um, has a whole facility up at Yellowstone and their whole purpose is to create and try and find ways to keep people safe from bears and predominantly what they do is try out different types of trash cans. So if you ever go to Yellowstone National Park, you can see a little display there where they've got different trash cans to keep people safe. And you can see we've got a couple over there and then over, oh, did they move? There was one more over here and I, oh yes, this one's a, a different one. So we've got a different one over here. It's a little bit different. It doesn't have the tops to it. So you can put like stuff in it to store it. This is not for trash, but maybe if you want to store food or something inside here so that they can't get it. There you go. Got that one. And so you would just put your hand up in here, release it. Uh, I get my hand in there. And there we go. You can store stuff in there. All right. So how can you tell the difference between brown bears and black bears? And you might think that the color of their fur might give it away. Um, and sometimes that's true. Uh, black bears tend to have black fur and brown bears tend to have a more brown fur. But it's not always true. Um, some black bears have almost a cinnamon color uh, to them. And so it's not a guarantee that their fur color is going to tell you what you need to know um, as far as the difference between the two. Now, I have a friend who is a bear scientist, and he has told me that the best way to tell the difference between the two is the their forehead, how the forehead and their nose um, uh, kind of the shape of it, okay? Um, in a black bear, their forehead and their nose is kind of a straight line. It's kind of very flat, like like that. Whereas in a brown bear, it's uh, the brown bear nose kind of comes out and it dishes in and then the head comes up. And I will put a link to a diagram um, in, oh, right, right there, how about that, okay? Um, uh, so that you can see that. So that is one way. You can also look at the claws. So let's talk about bears for a minute. Uh, so are there bears on the Panaleo Mountains, Mount Graham? Yes, absolutely. Um, now they are amongst the smallest of black bear bears. Um, there are, uh, and I don't know why that is. My guess is because, um, there's probably not a ton to eat on this mountain. Although those, oh, do you remember the berries from video two that they like to eat? 
It's little apple in Spanish. Manzanita berries, they love those. 80% of their diet when their berries are out. Um, I don't know why they're small, uh, smaller here on this mountain, but they are. Uh, so they'd be maybe my size with a lot more fur and maybe a little more weight um, here on this mountain. And my understanding, and I don't know if this has scientifically been proven, uh, but my colleague tells me there are more black bears on this mountain uh, per, uh, per mile um, than, than there are in most places in North America. So um, even though you may not see them, they certainly exist on this, this mountain. Now, let's talk about bears. Uh, in North America, we've got two major uh, species. Uh, black bears are the most common and are the only ones that come down this far uh, south. But if you go north, you've got grizzly bears, right? Um, black bears and grizz grizzly bears are different in how you react to them. Black bears, um, if you encounter them, uh, first of all, <laughs> try not to startle them. Um, but if, if uh, you're confronted with them, uh, you know, you're supposed to act big. Um, don't threaten them in any way, but act big. Uh, make noise if they uh, attack. Um, so th the next question about bears is, what do you do if you're attacked? Well, with a black bear... Um, if you're attacked, then you fight back with everything you have. You do whatever you can to get away. Um, don't play dead with a black bear. Um, if it's a grizzly or brown bear, um, you can play dead. Uh, put your, your hand over the back of your, your neck and lay flat on the ground. Um, and hopefully that, that will help. Um, and so w are these guarantees that, that you'll survive? Absolutely not. Um, and so the question is, is do you bring some kind of defense? Well, my, my bear scientist friend uh, also looked at the differences between having a firearm with you when you're in bear country or bear spray. And he compared survival uh, with encounters with bears. And uh, the, the statistics are, are rather clear. Bear spray is much more effective um, and there's several reasons for that. With a firearm, you have to be precise in your shooting. With bear spray, because it, it's a spray, you don't have to be quite so precise. Um, and so it's much, much more effective. So if you're going to go into um, bear country, make sure you have a can of bear spray. So uh, the can on the left is a bear spray can. And it is designed to send... Uh, it's a basically intense pepper spray, and it, it can send that bear spray, you know, 30 feet. Uh, on the right, you've got a little container for, uh, mace container for human self-defense, not nearly as powerful, and doesn't send the spray nearly as far. And so that's not sufficient. For bears, you need the one on the left. So let's talk about another tree. Um, the second, tr another tree I want to tell you about, not the second, um, it, that's up here in large quantities is the tree that's right behind me here. Um, here's the leaf. This is what we call the silver leaf oak. And the reason it's called the silver leaf oak is not the top of the leaf, but it's the bottom of the leaf. The bottom of the leaf, especially if you're here first thing in the morning when the sun is just coming up, and the sun hits the bottom of those leaves, it kind of gives a silvery sheen to it. And too bad it's not the right day for that, for me to show you that, uh, cause it's kind of cloudy and overcast right where I'm at. But uh, these, the undersides of these leaves um, give it that, that name for the silver leaf oak tree that is in large quantities around here. I'll come back to that in a minute. But I've got another tree right here that you already know. And I want to see if you can, you can uh, see what it is. Check that out. 
and look at the scales. So, do you know what this is? This is alligator juniper, right? Okay. Okay. And then let's try one more, see if you know what this one is. There's a truck that back there making quite a squawk. Okay. You know what this is? Look at that bark back in there. Let's look at these leaves. Kind of leathery leaves. Uh, often fruit. This is the point leaf manzanita. Point leaf manzanita. Um, okay. And uh, let's see what else. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So I told you that the main pine here is um, is pond, uh, Pinus ponderosa. Uh, point um, uh, <laughs> ponderosa pine. But if you look right above me here, I just happen to be standing in a place. Now you see all those pine cones up there? That's a dead giveaway. And also the pine uh, needles, let me show you these. These pine needles, they're not nearly as long as what I showed you before. Let's see if I can grab a couple of the ponderosa pine needles. See how long, five inches. These are an inch and a half, two inches at most. Um, so there is another pine tree up here. Uh, the other pine tree is uh, Chihuahua pine. Uh, Chihuahua pine is mostly on mountain ranges in Mexico, but here in the Panaleo Mountains uh, on Mount Graham, um, we do have some of those Chihuahua pine trees. Um, and I told you about all the pine needles that are on these trees. You can kind of, or the pine cones that are on these trees. Um, they produce pine cones year round, uh, Ponderosa or the Chihuahua pine. And so that is a good indication um, that it is a Chihuahua pine if it has pine cones. And those pine cones can last a couple of years on that tree. Okay, um, if you look at its bark, oh, it's all wet, so it kind of looks dark right now. But if I go right here, um, it has that same red bark that the ponderosa pine does, and so that's not reliable. And you can also smell vanilla on this one, so that smell may also not tell you. So look up when you're here, and if you see a bunch of pine cones on it, it's probably the Chihuahua pine. The, the other thing about the Chihuahua pine is its pine cones are usually pretty soft. Let's see if I can find one here. And they're usually pretty small. Um, be, again, because they're, they spend so long on the tree. Okay. Oh, here's one. Here's, yeah. So here's a pine cone. Small, small pine cone. With the Ponderosa pine cones, they're going to be much, much bigger. Okay. Um, so... Uh, those are a couple of trees. Now look at this right here. What is this? I just taught you this a few minutes ago. See that silvery bottom? That is our uh, silver leaf oak tree. Now on our silver leaf oak tree, look at this particular one. We've got something really cool going on here. This is a lichen. Okay. Moss tends to grow on the north sides of trees, um, and, and it's an actual plant, okay? Lichens, this stuff is not a plant. This is a symbiosis. So what kind of symbiosis is lichens? Well, lichens is a symbiosis. Oh, what is a symbiosis? Two life forms living together for mutual benefit. So one more time, a symbiosis are two life forms living together for mutual benefit. Um, so in this case, it's living on, lichen is on a rock. And you can see a couple of different species on here. The darker ones is, are one species, the lighter ones another. Um, we've even got a small 
right close there there's a third species a whole bunch of species on this particular boulder okay here and um so what's the symbiosis between you have a fungus and an algae living together in a sandwich for mutual benefit for each other the algae uh can do photosynthesis and create sugars and the fungus uh, can co collect nutrients um, and so from the rocks and from the surrounding and so they work together to survive so i decided to go on a little hike while i was up here and I discovered something that I'd forgotten about a little bit and I want to show it to you and that's behind me here. You'll notice that there's an opening right over here and on this side we've got our ponderosa pine forest over here. I'll just want to cover the sun a little bit. We've got an open area. So back in 2003 there was the Nettle Fire and it burned about 30,000 acres right up here near the top of Mount Graham, okay? And so that open area that you can see up there, and if you look right up on the ridge, right there, you can see some tree skeletons that are, that are still there from that fire. Um, those, those tree skeletons are what's left of that. Now, if you look right in here, you can see that the trees are starting to recover. Uh, the ponderosa pine trees, some of them are really tiny still, and some of them are well over my head. Um, as we walk up here, get a better sight of those. So we can see those trees a bit better here, and they're recovering, those trees. But that was 2003 and it's 2024. So that's over 20 years ago now. And you can see how long it's gonna take. So how long will it take for these trees to become like this again? You know, probably close to a hundred years or more, maybe 200 years or more. Um, who knows, probably a hundred years, uh, it'll recover. So just a little note on fire recovery, uh, wildfire recovery. Um, I think that's a, a, an interesting and valuable insight on, on uh, wildfires. So on our next video, I'm going to give you a little highlight of something. Um, but our, in our next video, I'm going to talk about the trees behind us. Notice that the trees behind me have white bark. Okay, so here on Mount Graham, I'm at the very lowest. So I'm at a, I think I'm at about 7,500 feet where I'm at at the moment. Uh, just a little above um, uh, the Acar Arcadia campground. But these trees behind me here are aspen trees. Um, most aspen trees reproduce in a really weird way. And it's really cool at the same time. Um, so just a little nugget of information before our next video and our next field trip. Thanks for coming. We'll talk to you later. Hey friends, I am up above 8,000 feet now. I am at Ladybug Saddle, uh, named for two reasons. It's a saddle kind of over one side to the other. So this is the north side and this is the south side of the mountain. And so this is Ladybug Saddle Pass, if you will. Um, and uh, it's Ladybug because if you hike up there around June, uh, you're gonna find millions of ladybugs. It is a breeding site for ladybugs and it is gorgeous. So if you ever get a chance, come up here, check out that incredible scene uh, in uh, early June, I believe. Uh, around Memorial Day too, so late May, early June. Um, anyway, so I wanted to show you this. Um, because for one thing, there is an awful lot of snow up here right now. There's a ton of snow. 
a foot or two, uh, depending on where you're standing, I guess. And so this water that is falling on here is absolutely crucial to um, the water, not only in our valley, um, but also uh, for the trees and the wildlife on this mountain. Um, so what happens when the water falls on this mountain? Well, if it falls in snow, which is what we want, we want as much precipitation as snow up here as possible. And the reason for that is, is because it's holding that water in place. If it falls as rain, it just runs off the mountain and uh, goes down, down the mountain and um, yeah, we lose it usually. Uh, maybe a, a flash flood, will may, it'll make its way to the rivers, but more than likely it'll just evaporate off the mountain. Holding the snow here as uh, the, per, the, the water here as, um, as snow, the precipitation, allows the water to infiltrate into the soils and then it'll percolate through the soils down into our water tables, okay? And so this is the source of many of the water, um, where our water comes from if you have a whale. Uh, the cotton in the Gila Valley um, most of that is well water that's pumped out of the ground. Well, where, where does that water come from? There it is, right there. That, wa that water, that precipitation, snow, will infiltrate down into the ground and then percolate and eventually come up as uh, well water. Uh, and is the source of much of the water that's in our aquifers.